Okay, okay. So we are uh, live with Jason Aka Artno and Martin. Thank you so much to both of you for being here today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. I know Jason has had his uh, second shot uh, of uh, of his vaccine, as always when when me and him speak. Um, so I've told him if he you know if he feels not a hundred percent, he can just <laughs> move to one side. If I, if I pass out, email my wife and tell her just to nudge me and wake me back up. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as, as I mentioned, like in, in the tweet earlier, I think like both of you have, you know, have been around for, for quite some time. Uh, and actually maybe let's start with that. Like, let's start with, you know, intros and how you, how long have you been in crypto art and what kind of got you started? Um, Jason, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Happy to. So, uh, yeah, I started um, in late 2017. So I've been in art and tech my whole life, um, studied art for undergrad and graduate school and worked in tech startups and grew up in a family of engineers. So kind of always been in art and tech, but didn't come to blockchain until late 2017. So I'd already been writing about um, AI and ML and art and a friend of mine, um, Ahmed Hosni, who uh, is like an AI ML researcher was like, hey, you should really check out blockchain. Um, you know, I think it'd be really relevant to, I, I was doing this massive project where I was scanning all these catalog resumes and trying to build the, the world's largest database of complete works from 20th century artists. And all I knew about Bitcoin was sort of that it had to do with money and that like maybe, I mean, I'm a nerd, but I thought like maybe it's a different kind of nerd. I just, I wasn't sure that it was gonna be for me, right? Um, but I really respect Ahmed, so, um, I had um, a couple days off for, for the holiday. It was like December of 2017 and did a half a day's research, bought a crypto kitty, bought a couple crypto punks, which turned out to be a pretty smart investment. Um, but, but really it was when I um, bought um, a work by Mohara on uh, Data NYC that things kind of clicked for me that like, hey, like, you know, as soon as I bought it for like five or six bucks, he like pinged me on Twitter and was like, thanks, man. And like we got in a conversation and I was like, whoa, for like five or six dollars, I can like buy art from people all around the world and become friends with creatives everywhere. And like there's like, you know, talk about secondary markets and royalties and things like that. So um, after a couple of hours of, of um, you know, buying things and kind of research, I wrote an article um, called The Blockchain Art Market is Here in late 2017. Like, kind of went viral and people started asking me questions and that's when I figured out that I better go start talking to people because I didn't really know that much. So, you know, sought out people like Martin and others um, over the last few years to to learn more so that I can get my own story straight when I share it with other people. Nice, interesting. So you kind of met Martin through your discovery of crypto art, right? Is that is that correct? I'm not exactly sure when Martin and I's paths uh, crossed. Were you at uh, Rare AF one, Martin, or did I, uh, I was at the second? I think I think the first pass we crossed paths. It was in in eighteen. I think you curated a show uh, for uh, for Paris. I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, oh, that's think, right. Yeah, and I curated one of your works in. I think. Yeah. Uh, exactly. If I remember correctly. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't know that I fully even positioned you in my head as being like on the blockchain side as much then is, is just that I really liked your work. Um, but now it makes sense that I kind of piece, um, piece that together. And then definitely Rare AF2, right? Mm -hmm. We hung yeah. out um, then too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but I've been using your, your timeline. Um, so people think I know a lot about um, <laughs> and, um, and NFT history, but I pretty much just reference Martin's timeline. I think that's what everybody does. <laughs> Martin, do you want to talk uh, a bit about you know your timeline and also how you got into it? Sure. Um, so I've been working in the traditional arts, but always like um, with technology. So I was always um, I have like extremely long processes. You know, I can work on pieces sometimes over a year or two, and so I always had like computers and technology help me do basically. Um, you know, some sort of mock-ups and, and, and verify my concepts before I embark like on such a long endeavor, right? Um, and then in 2017, I kind of stumbled upon like blockchain technology, read a few books and thought like there gotta be something about art 
And that's how I started kind of like looking more into it and discovering then, you know, in April already, like with the launch, all these platforms and got super interested in it, um, was able to join fairly early on. And um, so I was working then on a piece in 2018 um, when I visualized Ethereum blocks for a conference um, here in Montreal. And it took me like a really long time to develop that because like I don't consider myself a coder, but I love tinkering with like generative art and, and, and algorithms. So, you know, I was displaying it at the Canadian Center for Architecture and, and wrote a blog post about it. And then um, while I was researching for the blog post, I discovered that like Ria Myers beat me like four years to kind of like a similar concept. And I was like, oh my God, you know, like um, there you are, think you are like, um, doing something, but there was like no real resource where you could like consult and, and find out more about it. So I started looking more into it. The blog post became longer and longer. So I kind of like had to convert it into a timeline because it was just not possible to capture. And it was just so fascinating to see um, how long and rich the history is and, you know, how reflective the history is also like of what happens in the whole ecosystem. So, you know, in the beginning where there's like hardly any like applications, dApps or, or like marketplaces, you know, the early artworks revolved really around like the currency itself or like, you know, the, the early outlets like uh, the Darknet and Silicon Road. And you have like pieces from 2014, which really kind of conceptually integrate that. And the more, you know, the, the richer the history gets, you see it like also reflecting in the artwork that it becomes more conceptual and it kind of reflects what is available um, in the ecosystem. And how did you start your your timeline? Like, did you start it from, you know, as soon as kind of you you came into the space, you're like, okay, I'm gonna kind of like start to con contextualize everything through dates or was it after, you know, a while? Um, I kind of like the date structure because I was just like so surprised and amazed, you know, that that these pieces go back like 2013 and 14 and you know that there was already so interesting work so I kind of had the idea of, of organizing it by years um, as you know the list of entries grew um, I kind of had to include like really like months and, and days in order to sort these entries because it's 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 fascinating I think I'm, I'm closing into 200 entries now and I still have like a backlog of about 160 170 I never can get below 150 because it's kind of like you know you open one door and and you discover new things um and it's it's kind of like a fun passion project where like you know in the beginning I was really like combing through like the Bitcoin talk forum and reddit and then you know, you discover exhibitions, the exhibitions lead you to artists, lead you to conferences. And it's kind of like, you know, one leads to another and it never seems to stop. And and <laughs> it's just it's just so fascinating how much was already done, how how interesting and intricate pieces were already created. And that, you know, especially the early history seems to have been forgotten because, you know, there was not really a lot mm -hmm. of interest in it. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess like a question for you both is if you had to define uh, from, you know, the early, early stages, like you're saying, maybe for even from 2013, 2014, um, what is crypto art? What would be your definition of it? And um, Jason, if you want to start. Sure. Yeah, I think when what so everyone, unless you started, everyone's a, a late comer at some point. So even when I got here at 2017, there were a lot of people that had already been in the space for a while, right? But I was I had decent SEO and was kind of bold. So I was like, all right, I'm going to define crypto art. I wrote this article called What is Crypto Art? And I essentially collapsed the words crypto art with no space in between. And this is before we had the words, uh, the, the acronym NFT. Sometimes mm -hmm. people called those like dank rares back in the day. There was other, other language, right, for art that actually sort of has become what we now know as NFT. So I described, you know, crypto art, no space as being sort of this global movement, right? Where, um, you know, this sort of decentralized and people, you know, do meme based art and there's like, you know, uh, it's, it's stored on the blockchain. And so there's like all these things that I kind of wrote out. And, um, you know, like anyone who comes in new, I was new back then, you sort of accidentally step on other people um, that you don't mean to because you don't know better, right? So I think, um, you know, I was educated by folks like Crypto Graffiti and Coin Artist and others who were like, hey, 
you know, crypto art's already a thing. Like it's art about crypto. It's not necessarily it doesn't have to be on the blockchain or be a token. Mm. You know, it can really be any art that's that's um, could be a canvas or a mural or something that kind of talks about crypto art. So for a while, I was kind of defining it as like crypto art, no space in the middle was this new global movement that was largely digital art that was like, you know, largely token based, which we now kind of refer to as NFTs. Um, but I, I think uh, it's the, the the definitions sort of warrant, um, you know, more structure or, or definition. So, you know, I, I think there's a thing in art history where we kind of pretend like digital art, even more broadly than crypto art, we pretend like it's a brand new thing that just happened. Like every five years, it's like, oh, like digital art, like this is a new thing. And it's like, it's really not right. So there's a, a, a art history that goes back to the 60s with you know, Georg Nies and Michael Knoll and Fred Arnaka and later Vera Molnar, like, you know, this sort of generative space. And what I'd like to see is is us do not only a better job in, in defining crypto art, but kind of looking at the full legacy of, of um, computer art and digital art and, and, you know, get a vernacular on how we describe all of these things, right? So, um, so for me, I guess that's kind of a long-winded way of saying I look at it from like a funnel. So there's like digital art at the top, and, and then we kind of go down to like, crypto art and i think my space no space thing has kind of lost the battle now that we have um <laughs> there uh, but you know crypto art is broadly art that whether it's on chain or off chain you know that broadly art that deals with um crypto um or art that doesn't necessarily deal with crypto and then is on the chain i think that's when you get into nfts so not all crypto art or nfts and not on all nfts or crypto art is maybe the way i would describe it there are some people that don't really care necessarily a bunch about crypto or crypto culture um, that are putting out NFTs. And there are some people that, you know, have been doing crypto art for a long time um, that aren't all that jazzed about uh, NFTs sort of in the other direction. So, yeah, digital art, crypto art doesn't even necessarily have to be digital. It's just art about crypto. And then we've got NFTs, which for me, it's like where the token is the actual thing you're, you're collecting. And then there's sort of a link to the image or to and of course, not all NFTs. Um, are art uh, related, right? Um, so there's like landscapes and domain names and all kinds of other things that you have there too. So I think Martin or I or both of us or someone else, in addition to a timeline, needs to make like a really fancy Venn diagram that kind of explains like- I already have a diagram. Oh, you've got it? Call it <laughs> up, man. Why are you making me- <laughs> No, 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 I gonna, I, because I'm still working on it, but let me see oh. if I can pull it up. But there yeah, is actually- please. It is. It is uh, something I'm working on since 2019. Believe it or not. Nice. Um, because because I was initially I also saw like the two um, the two big family or like you know thought leaders that think okay either way um, it's gonna be something which is related to the crypto culture and mm -hmm. and regardless of the medium that's kind of like you know one side which thinks you know the the, the crypto sphere went through a lot of hardship through a lot of drama through a lot of um, um you know being ignored being laughed at um so there's something ideologic in it and then the other side which is really like okay it has to be like conceptually in the blockchain um so i'm i'm like fully side with jason who who by the way his articles i think single-handedly onboarded thousands of artists so so you know this is amazing work and and you know he's a huge advocate for the whole space and and you know a pillar of the crypto family um, so, so just that in between, but, um, I think, you know, the, the second side is really that, that sees it net natively digital, you know, and I think, and I agree with that. Um, so where, where I kind of hesitated is I kind of saw like three areas, which kind of are blockchain related, right? It can be either like related to the currency by being like available for crypto. It can be thematically linked and, mm -hmm. um, it can basically um yeah now i kind of forgot my third one see that's when i don't have the graph in front of me <laughs> but then you have like one common one common area and it, that's kind of where it makes the step for me to crypto art is when it kind of is conceptually linked to the blockchain so that could be either as an nft or it uses the technology because i think there's like very very interesting conceptual work early work before even tokens were like kind of popular which i still consider as crypto art like you know for instance in 2014 ria myers created like a, a smart contract which is called this contract is art 
and you could basically trigger the smart contract and define if it's art or it's not art. And you know, pieces like that, I think, even though it's not a token, but they kind of like inherently use um, the technology to express it. So, so I, I'm I'm on one page here with Jason. You know, it doesn't have to be exclusively an NFT, um, but it definitely is for me personally. I think it's digital, and it kind of has an an relationship to digital art and and crypto. And Coldy totally agrees with both <laughs> of you. I think. Yeah. Um, and That's I guess, you know, well, talking, uh, especially now that I'm, I'm seeing this comment of, uh, of Coldy, like he, uh, as, as others are one of, you know, the, the, the artists that have been probably in the space for the longest, probably not since 2014, but like to my eyes, let's say mm -hmm. for somebody who came in like last year. Um, and again, I resonate with what, you know, you, Jason, are saying when you came in, you know, you kind of thought that like, you, it's like, it's, you always feel like you're stepping on someone else's toes because you know that there's been so much that has happened before, uh, and so much that still has to happen. But for some reason, like people say, oh no, but you've been in the space for a long time. And it's like, yeah, but like, there's people that have been in the space for a long, long, long time. <laughs> so I know nothing, you know, uh, but so I resonate completely with that. But I guess like. Coming back to my point, um, I, you know, there's been artists that have kind of like, um, to my, in my eyes, like built up the, the the history of crypto art. Like they they've they've kind of like built, um, yeah, like a, a context to where we are where we are now, um, and in 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 some way or form, like I feel like maybe sometimes like that's in my eyes, like kind of gets like forgotten. Um, so I, I want to bring it back to, to that and to, you know, the, the, even like the themes, like the, the artists, the people who have kind of like, uh, built this, this community, this ecosystem to where, to where it is now. And yeah, asking to you both, like how, you know, who are you know who are these who are not even like names but like what are the the themes what is the 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 pillars that have that have kind of like led to the community being what it is now yeah i'm happy to start unless you want to jump sure. on that one martin no no yeah. uh, go ahead please yeah so i think you know this is going to change depending on everyone you ask right so everybody and and it's um, for a few reasons, I think different people have different ideas of what's important in terms of, you know, the artwork or, you know, what they're interested in or where it overlaps with the blockchain. And sometimes people, um, you know, will be like, well, you know, if you're telling the story, you know, there are other versions of the story and, and to which I always respond, there are, and everyone should tell their version, right? Like, I think mm -hmm. the idea that because one version is imperfect, no one should say anything is counterproductive. So I think everyone should tell their version of the story. And really it is about acknowledging, I think to the degree that you can, the people that came before you. So I think um, I, I'm not a huge fan of firstism, I call it. We see a lot of it on Twitter where like every day it's like, first this NFT, first that, NFT, first NFT, you know, that like doubles as a doggy door, the first taco NFT, there's like, it's just absurd, right? And, and I carry that all the way back to the beginning where I'm not so sure that I could say 100% who the first artist is to, to make NFTs, but I think generally um, you've got people playing around with like ASCII art and then it's around 2014 that for me, it's, you know, Martin's mentioned uh, Rhea Myers is doing really important work. Uh, Nilly Lerner, who um, mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of doing a clubhouse talk with, I always thought that she was important and Joe Looney, who's, you know, I'll get to you in a minute, you know, always told me like she was really early and really important and actually kind of got beat up for it because she was describing essentially NFTs. But even the Bitcoin folks were like, that's too wacky, you know, like that's a scam essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so she was really thoughtful and ahead of her time. Also 2014. Right. Um, Kevin McCoy and Anil Dash, I think also 2014. Right. And kind of publicly talked about a system um, that that sounds a bit like, you know, NFTs. I think of all of them as sort of like um, progenitors, like earlier, you know, early versions. It's not quite a fully formed NFT at that point, but it's, you know, the concepts are there. And, and when I look at it, what's interesting is the further you go back, and I think Martin kind of touched on this, the smaller the audience, right? So there's like the story of NFTs over the, and crypto art over the last, you know, 10 years or so is, in my mind, is about 
a bunch of uh, really creative nerds um, doing stuff in isolation in the beginning without knowing that other people were also doing these experiments with limited audience and a limited amount of people actually believing what they in what they were doing, right? So like, you know, a lot of people were like, these thought these early people were kind of crazy, right? But then there are other key contributors. There's a point where we start to see momentum and, and more people join in, right? And this is why I think the, the Rare Pepe is, is such an important chapter and it gets left out for, for reasons we can talk about. But you've got all these important people in 2014 that I think you know Martin and I would agree on, although I, I think he probably has some others he could throw in there too. Then we hit, but, but really not a ton of people know about them, right? And you could also talk mm -hmm. maybe about people that are more in the traditional art world, like Simon Denny, Kevin A. Bosch, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But even then, for different reasons, you have a more isolated group. It's a smaller group of people that are into what they're doing, right? Um, what, what the Rare Pepe uh, platform did, in my mind, is it actually, it becomes the first real platform. It's not just an individual doing like a, a project. And while it was sort of a joke initially, um, it gained momentum pretty quickly, right? So it, it uh, puts into place a lot of these um, ideas that have carried forward um, in the best of the new platforms around like, you know, uh, not charging artists, right? And trying to decentralize. They weren't there to tell you that your art was good or bad. They were just trying to keep the stuff, the, the scientists on the Rare Pepe board were trying to keep the stuff off that would be like illegal or whatever, right? Um, so this whole idea of like a platform that's just not about digital art, but about, you know, using these, um, you know, which now I think we could call NFTs, you know, you could, we can get into a debate about that, but as ways to do things like access tokens to like unique music or like even Rare Pepe gift cards, like there are a lot of things that I think were there that haven't even fully developed on the, on the, the main platform. So the the art is interesting but more importantly to me that's when we start to see that as a platform this can scale beyond a handful of individual projects that sort of us as you know tech art nerds are, are off uh doing right and then after that we we get the crypto punks project um which is pretty audacious when you think about it back then like not that many people into this stuff and they're like we're gonna do ten thousand, right um you know and they're just it's hard for people to realize there isn't a lot of precedent there, right, for that kind of a project. Um, it's pretty wacky that, that, that they did it and that it had the level um, of success that it had. So while I think um, there are pioneers in terms of people like 2014 that are really doing sort of like the early makings of an NFT, um, those things could have stayed fairly obscure within either the art world circles or the blockchain world circles. And I think it's really a Rare Pepe uh, wallet and um, and the CryptoPunks that kind of bring these as art projects out to the, to the masses. And of course, later CryptoKitties, which people tend to lean more into um, onto the collectible side. So, so that's kind of scales it up. But then there's still this question that we struggle with today about like, as it scales, how do we scale it meaningfully? And I think that's where things like um, Data NYC come in, right? So, um, you know, there's, so the, the, the summary is a bunch of sort of um, cool art nerds doing things individually. Then we start to get platforms and more popular things. And then as we start to scale, we have growing pains about how do we grow in a thoughtful and meaningful way. And that's where I think I refer to Data NYC as sort of like the soul of the movement um, early on and arguably still in some ways and trying to put artists first. And then uh, real quickly, and I'll stop because I don't want to use up all the, the points, but I tend to mark um, NFT history or crypto art history in terms of the Rare AFs, right? Um, because so much has changed so quickly. So Rare AF1, it's hard to believe, but there's an article out there somewhere where I'm like begging artists to go onto these platforms because artists didn't know what this stuff was. We had more platforms than we had artists, right? Which sounds crazy because there's lines out the door for things like Super Rare now, but um, you know, you could pretty much be anyone and like the platforms would take you in a heartbeat because there were a lot of tech folks making platforms that didn't have art background. So that first year was really like, how do we get artists on? You know, like I brought Robbie and um, Hackatow over to Super Rare and, you know, I tried to help with the, the known origin guys. Um, and then the second year was, OK, now we've got artists and platforms, but the market was kind of tanking the crypto market. like. Where, where are the collectors? And we had this conversation, I don't know if you remember, Martin, at Rare AF2, where it was kind of like, is this even going to be a thing next year? Like there just wasn't, it's hard to believe, but 2019, there really weren't that many people interested in collecting at all, right? So no one could have foreseen what we're experiencing 
today, a lot of us were just like, are we going to have to pack it up? We still like the, the, the few people that are sticking around. But then um, collectors started coming in, you know, that following year. So late 2019, 20 into 2020, we started seeing a little bit of a secondary market. So Rare AF3, I call that the secondary market year, right? Because my mm -hmm. art world friends were like, that's that's cute that like you some random crypto bros are like buying you know periodically buying NFTs but if you don't have a secondary market you don't have anything there's just not it's not even a real market right so I think you know that's when we started to think about well you know I guess we have to cough up some of the early work and resell it and like you know point to you know uh, these earlier artists as as ways to get to show that there is a secondary market right um, and that kind of brings us around to this year and I think this year it's really about um, dealing with the ecological concerns as now that we have this magnifying glass on us, right? Um, you know, how do we deal with the ecological concerns and then sort of the, the technocracy, making sure that these variable gas fees, um, we find a way that those don't keep out people from parts of the world who can't afford to participate. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I, I lump topics to each of the, um, the rare AFs, but I know that's a, a lot. I probably went too long there. No, it's excellent. No, I no, think. that's, yeah. I 100%. And maybe just one one thing to add, which I found fascinating, um, is if you go even a little bit earlier before 2014, you know, you see you have like a digital currency, everything is digital. And it really evoked a need for some physical and artistic expression. So you see, you know, it started really with like people wanting to have like some sort of coin representation or physical representation of their bitcoins or or you know, mm -hmm. so it, it really started like with Cassius coins and other collectibles because people wanted to have something, you know, which kind of, which they have physically, which they can look at, which they can share, which they can, I don't know, let other people touch. I don't know what it is. And and in this time, you know, you see at these conferences, they specifically um, approached artists to contribute, you know, there were like conferences and they would invite local artists to paint murals, to create a painting. And, and that was like kind of like the first, um, or, or at least from, from where I am now, because that story changes from <laughs> very fast and very often. But, you know, people were really like invited to kind of like depict and, and kind of express this, this, you know, story of the, the early crypto people and and all what it entailed you know the, the mount gox scams and and you know the losses the the you know all this this mystery around satoshi all the all the the you know the myths about like getting rich fast and like it's it's there's so many elements to it and it really like was was asking for um a creative output right so that's why i think where a lot of these these um, early artists see really this, this theme of Bitcoin so crucial for crypto art because this is where it kind of seemed to have started. Um, and, and the second point, I think, you know, Jason summed it up really well, um, is, is where we are now. You know, I think um, one thing I'm also kind of like uh, try to focus is, you know, a lot of things we have these days and, and secondary market is one of these, you know, big big elements which which a lot of people perceive as like a game changer um we are not there yet you know we take things for granted but we haven't i think we have grown too fast and we have not been able to establish some sort of values and standards which we want to implement in this space so you see you know now with there's like a plethora of new platforms coming out you know there's like things like secondary, you know, royalties of like 1% or none at all. Yeah. It's an afterthought. It's an, on the roadmap. But this is not what what we're trying to 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 work here, you know. And I think this is where, um, you know, like the initiative which Matt Cain started in, in 2010, um, which which was, which you know, which he basically teamed up with Lawrence Lee, Bart Johnson, others. Um, Kind of formed within a month you know like a, a, a back then platform wide standard for royalties you know but yet we are still here um a year later um a you know there's still no no like um it's not ingrained that royalties are so important a lot of new artists don't even care or seem to care you know and um we don't have really a standard which enforces them you know like even tesos you know and, and hick and nang um, which is, you know, which is a great new project, but they're going to be listed on, on OpenSea. So 
they're basically you know being removed from their system and being able to you know avoid again the secondary market fees for the artist and i think this is something where we have to work and focus on um collectively you know that artists collectors creative front and say okay let's create some sort of standard because right now we are we are not improving the system you know we are just helping you know create marketplaces but we're not helping the artists um yeah. and i think this is something where where um i think things like like the timeline or so or at least i try to put a focus on milestones in this regard is still very thinly um <laughs> And and I'm working right now in discussion with a few people to kind of create a little committee because I want to kind of you know take my bias a little bit away from it, and and you know also include more artworks which I think are um, important were kind of like defining or are relevant but I don't want to be the one who's making the decision alone, <laughs> and and. Um, elements like that you know the, the history how the royalties came up and things like that should have their space you know contributions like jason's you know to the space they they need to have their space and i kind of think this is this is going this is an important part of the history which is right now not really talked about and and not really considered mm -hmm. from, from the lens of platforms right currently like you know the there's if we think about let's say for example like a committee of of artists like a a group that is you know artists only like Art is speaking about art and protecting what their like rights as artists are. We don't really, or at least not that I know of, maybe we do, um, have that uh, as such. Like obviously, you know, there's Twitter, which is a great community to you know be involved. But it, it kind of like it's kind of like put through the lens of of, of platforms. It's like artists have given the platforms um, the the power in a way to do the job for them, you know, in terms of like royalties, in terms of secondary sales, et cetera. Um, so, you know, whilst you were speaking, I was thinking that that's, you know, that's a, a really good point because actually there's not really a, a, like a collective, you know, of artists that say, okay, this is happening now. This is where the space is. What, what are the things that we need to work on that are, you know, royalties, for example, secondary sales, etc. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I know early on um, when I came to it and was first learning about blockchain and Bitcoin and Ethereum, there's such a strong uh, thread of sort of um, decentralization and getting rid of the, the middleman. And I got swept up into it, you know, um, sort of ideologically late 2017 to early 2018 and was writing about how I just assumed that all artists would be having their own essentially website and minting their own, um, you know, work on their own contracts. Right. And to the point where I was advising a bunch of other platforms and telling them like, look, this is inevitable. The same way the whole point of, you know, the cryptocurrency is to sort of get rid of the banker or the, the credit card processing people. It seemed inevitable at that time that, you know, we were going to get rid of uh, galleries or the platforms would sort of decentralize and become, um, you know, driven by individual artists. And a few actually tried to build those things out. And it turns out it was a, it's a huge oversight on my part, uh, which is sort of funny. I mean, I'm a marketing guy by trade during the day. Um, and really, it's it, it, there needs to, people don't like the word marketing, especially when it overlies with, with art. But the platforms serve this function, right, that we can't seem to get away from. You know, if you're an artist and you're just sort of endlessly pumping your own work, you know, people will only have so much tolerance for that, right? So there's sort of a need for an intermediary or a third party um, or someone to promote that work. And I think that that's the role the platforms play. At, at one point, I thought we might be able as a community to sort of decentralize that promotion and just, you know, encourage artists to promote each other's work as like a fast way to sincerely promote each other's work, but as a, a fast way to grow recognition across the community. But I think there's still some percentage of artists that sort of see each other as competition um, a bit that way. So not sure what the, um, the the solution is there in terms of what the right balance is with platforms. I mean, I'm friends with a lot of people that make the platforms and I know, you know, they, they've either taken money or need to pay, you know, to keep making the platforms better. I guess on the one hand, I see the community, you know, um, getting frustrated when when there's like heavy centralization, you know, um, and, and a lot of people can't seem to get on the platform and it's not really sure, clear what the rules are. It's like, well, you know, why 
why are we even doing this? But I think as long as there's a, and my, for my taste and everybody's different, as long as there's a, enough different approaches being, you know, experimented with some more centralized, some fully decentralized, some, you know, on Tezos, some on Ethereum, like my, my take is that the biggest danger is that we stop experimenting, right? If all of a sudden everything becomes a cookie cutter, so it's like, oh, you know, everybody makes the same kind of 3D art because that's what sells for the most. And they all sell it on this platform because that's where it sells for the most. And like, you know, I think that's the biggest threat. So I try to be conscientious when people are doing things early stages and experimenting, whether it's on the art or on the platform side, like even if it doesn't look or feel right to, to me personally in the beginning, I remind myself that we need a lot of different things out there, a lot of different experiments and, you know, um, things that are, you know, platforms that are trying new things or different things. And we're, I think we're starting to see that. I mean, for sure, there's some cash grab platforms out there, but none of them seem to do all that well. Uh, you know, people can kind of, you know, smell those ones, I think, from a mile away and um, tend to support the ones that are a, a bit more creative. Um, so, yeah, and I think that, you know, the, the other thing that maybe I'll throw in that's somewhat unrelated, but that Martin was bringing up that I liked is that um, this idea of sort of the mythology, like the Bitcoin pizza, right? Um, or, you know, even so there was mythology around the cryptocurrency that was being turned into art. But now we've gotten to a point where there's mythology around the crypto art, like, you know, the, the art itself, because we've been around for a few years now. And when people ask me like, oh, or tell me more likely, they're like, oh, this NFT thing and crypto art, it's just going to go away. It's like a bubble and it's going to go away in a few days or whatever. I, I tend to point them towards towards those mythologies, right? So when you have a culture where um, things come from the ground up with you know hundreds of thousands of people that have their own style of music and their own vocabulary and their own histories and mythologies, right? That's that's a pretty hard thing to have disappear overnight. And we as a group have been through it like every four years, right? So there's usually like a spike and then it kind of goes down and, you know, um, so, I mean, I, I think we've lived through it several times. I usually compare it for, for art world nerds. There's this thing called um, zombie formalism, which was sort of like a brief uh, period in the art world where people were overspending on young artists just to like for the sake to show that they were overspending and competing. And it didn't have like this root system and this culture, right? So the whole thing collapsed and people were specu all speculation and the speculators were stuck with, you know, this work they didn't want. But I look at um, crypto art more like I would look at street art, right? So there's like this deep, rich culture that goes back um, globally, mm -hmm. you know, through all these different paths and mythologies and things. That, and that's just, that's a hard thing to, to, to shut down or to have go away overnight. So that's partially why I'm so, um, you know, excited about the, the, the longevity of the space. Definitely, yeah. I also would. Uh, I also look forward to see maybe you know um, some artists exploring again beyond the NFT, you know, and then go more conceptual. Because I found that, you know, before we kind of were forced into like limitations like like file sizes, you know, data formats and other things, there was like really like super interesting, you know, work done on a grand scale. You know, just to give you a couple of examples, um, you know, we had like the Bail Block app which was basically an app where people would use their computers to mint Monero coins, which was used for like immigrant bail funds, you know? Yeah. Or you had like the Terra Zero tokens, which has like kind of experimented with like a DAO structure to create kind of like an, you know, community-led ecosystem. So, you know, it was kind of like, we were thinking on a maybe a little bit of a grander scale, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, now you could say, you know, Kevin Abosh with his ecological satellite might kind of bring us again into another dimension. But I think in general, it would be interesting to also see a little bit more exploration back, you know, maybe away from only the token itself. You know, I think I think there might be really a lot of a lot of um, a lot of spaces we haven't seen yet to to incorporate, to explore, to experiment. And and it shouldn't be necessarily only limited, you know, to like kind of like this this limited format of an NFT. Yeah, I think per, yeah. Per, uh, experimentally, conceptually and programmatically, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, w up until pretty recently, most people were still thinking about NFT art as like, you know, some like the, the number one question I was getting is like, how do I hang it on my wall, right? Um, and I think we're starting to see uh, people get a little more comfortable with the idea that it doesn't even have to be a static image and that it can be interactive and that you can have data feeds that change it dynamically and that it could also 
function as an access token of some type, right? Um, and I think when you marry the, the tech experimentation with the conceptual experimentation, a bit more like you were talking about, Martin, um, you know, literally sky is, is sort of the limit, right? So you always have that time period when you go from, you know, um, like books to, to um, uh, audio books or whatever, where everyone carried the, the Kindle around for a little while. I call it like the awkward teenage years, the middle stages, right? So we used to have books all over our walls and bookcases, and a lot of us needed to have something in our hand to call it a book. And most folks I know now just listen to audiobooks and there isn't even, or, or podcasts, and you don't even have the anything tangible anymore. And similar experience that we went through with music, right? Where um, for a while it was, you know, records and CDs and cassettes, and we needed that that uh, dedicated iPod for a while just so that we felt like those digital things lived somewhere. You know, there's that intermediary. And I think we might, might be coming out of sort of that intermediary. I kind of hope that we're coming out of that intermediary with art where people are like, well, I need to buy a digital frame for every single one of my NFTs and hang it because that's what you do with art, right? But I think I think there's a lot more that can be done that goes beyond um, the the need to frame something or hang it um, in terms of user experience or artistic exploration. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and actually it brings me, talking about experimentation, it brings me uh, to think like with Hecat Nunc, as you were mentioning before, Martin, which like from my perspective kind of seems where a lot of that experimentation is is happening in 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 a lot of ways like currently in the space and we had we were having like a conversation cuz Rafael the founder is, is thinking about you know how to build the DAO right mm -hmm. for Hicket Nuke and uh it's it's an interesting conversation it's, and and to be honest like I am completely not an expert so i i just like to take on you know a lot of different mm -hmm. like thoughts and he doesn't re nobody really knows how is the best way to build a dao because it's something so new right um but part of it is is uh we were speaking also about like potentially you know building like daos that can that having you know everybody who has the h dao uh token or um at the moment like potentially going into uh, build uh, buying land on in crypto voxels or any of the of the metaverses is kind of like using it as a as a, a gallery space an exhibition space but at the same time like also maybe doing like more kind of curatorial DAOs where like people can um, vote uh, like for specific kind of artwork that they like to be exposed etc so there's a lot of like uh, different kind of thoughts that you know have been bouncing around and I was wondering uh, what both maybe Martin you can start like what are your thoughts around like DAOs and how can they help the experimentation within the the space at the moment? I think you know in in, in general it's 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 uh, we have seen already several approaches trying to incorporate DAOs into marketplaces. You know I I remember for instance Rarible right it was like one of one mm -hmm. of the first who said like okay we're going to create a kind of like a DAO structure which will decide on which artists we're going to highlight or which artists we could accept. And I think, you know, that is, that is for me, um, a fairly elegant way to kind of remove a little bit this gatekeeperism we see from some platforms. You know, if this decision is made by, by, by basically peers, you know, it's kind of like more, um, and by a group, right? Not individuals. It's always kind of according to the spirit of this decentralized group decision making. Um, I think in general, you know, um, I think data itself is also thinking to some sort of, of a DAO structure, you know, where where you contribute as an artist, not only to yourself, but also to like a whole community of artists and kind of the whole community prospers with you. Um, and, and I think this is, this is a very fascinating approach, which is kind of like unique in this ecosystem, right? Where, where you kind of go like, okay, this is, we're going now towards like an um, basic income approach, right? And and we use mm -hmm. a DAO structure to kind of play around and, and help us towards, you know, disincentivizing, you know, necessarily individual benefits and, and kind of, of kind of um, linking it to also to like the community and an environment which kind of fosters it and, and so in general, I think there, there's already some good examples there, which could give some sort of guidelines, you know. Um, have we seen the, the forum? Probably not yet. And I think this is where the, what Jason mentioned, the experimentation has to take place, you know. There has to be um, communities which, which 
which are willing to to take the risk and and you know it's it's going to be only by trial and error because i don't think there is right now a system which has worked for for everything well you know you see sometimes these dao structures can also become um paralyzing for for projects you know so it's kind of like really um it's going to be to look at what exists and maybe you know reaching out to existing platforms and projects and, and trying to get some sort of lessons learned yeah absolutely do you have uh, any thoughts on any other thoughts jason sure yeah so um i actually owe further field an article that i'm kind of behind on uh but uh about their project um dao wow um so they actually brought DAOs. they do i think further field does an amazing job of uh like data and others of pulling away from just purely the speculative and transactional mm -hmm. aspects of this and really look at you know how can we use these technologies um and lead the way and showing ways that we can use them that makes a more equitable system for artists so these were in some cases DAOs that were in the physical world using some sort of social token as a you know they were more like um prototypes but how can you use social tokens to, to share resources among, you know, physical artists that work physically and share spaces and materials and things like that was uh, one of the projects. But yeah, I'd encourage folks to look at that. One thing, you know, I mean, I have to be honest, right? Um, you know, even if it's embarrassing, whenever whenever I got Rary or, you know, I'm getting the one from Hick at Nunk, um, I often just kind of kept cash in my my uh, DAO tokens or whatever pretty quickly when I when I get them and you know to be fair usually buy some more art or whatever, but I, I when I ask myself like why is that because like theoretically I'm into this idea of like having like you know a, a community driven um, set of instructions I think it's twofold one I don't think I've seen it done really well so I think part of me is just like well I don't know what a, a really well one well done system looks like. So I'm not literally ready to buy in necessarily. I mean, it's because it's literally because you've got you know some funds that you can cash out with. I think that that's probably um, part of it. And then an extension of that is that they're sort of like everything in this space. They're sort of inherently complicated, right? Um, so you have to get all the way up to where you understand what an NFT and all these things are, and then you have to go in a little bit deeper to start to figure out what DAOs are. So I think maybe given more um, educational resources and explanations and things like that as to what DAOs are and how they work, you'd get more people holding on to their tokens or wanting to find a way to participate or to ed educate others. Um, you know, um, I, I feel like, you know, maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, DAOs were like the thing everyone was talking about. Um, and then maybe we backed, backed away a little bit and I'm not sure why, um, you know, wh why it's not as hot a topic. Maybe it's, again, maybe it's the complexity or something like that. But I, I would like to see group governance um, come back, not exclusively. Like, I don't hate the fact that there are some of these platforms that are kind of curated by a couple of people or whatever. Um, but I'd also like to see, again, back to this experimentation, a handful of fully DAO driven uh, platforms and what that could look like. Mm -hmm. And actually, like, talking about uh, DAOs, I know it's not really like a, a DAO itself, but like Dada, in a way, kind of, you know, with their, their whole concept of, like, invisible economy, they probably is the platform that kind of comes, like, the cl closest to, to this idea of, like, complete decentralization, right? Like, do, do you, um, both of you, whoever wants to, like, kind of explain a little bit, like, the concept, um, you know, behind Dada? You want that one, Martin, or do you want me to start? Uh, I'll you, I'll, you probably know a little bit more about it. <laughs> well, I know the early days of Dada. I was actually an advisor for a while and did mm -hmm. a, a couple of offsites with them and still love them and think of them as a family. Um, but they've evolved, and it, uh, I haven't been able to keep up with their – there's a long document that describes their new economy. Um, and, and I can't profess to be an expert on that, but I would point folks to it and encourage them to read it. In the early days, I think their instincts and, and what they pushed and what I honestly believe they deserve a fair amount of credit for was this idea that, you know, um, there should be royalties for artists in the secondary market. But also they had these early ideas that if any artist sells anything, you know, why can't we divide that sale across all the artists, right? Because there's this problem in art when you start getting a, a positive reinforcement where when you make something and it sells, you're tempted to make that same thing and then it sells and other people mm -hmm. see you making that thing and it's selling. So they slowly start to, to move towards making the same thing you're mm -hmm. making, right? And Dada, I think one of the, the beautiful things about the way Bea and Judy think is 
they were like, well, that's that's the opposite of what you want in an art system, right? You want people to take risks, be challenging, do new things, right? So you need a system, you know, they were, for at one point they were talking about, um, crap, what's that, that payment structure where there's like a minimum amount of money that everybody gets? Uh, basic season. income? No. Thank you, yeah, the, the yeah universal basic income, mm -hmm. UBI, um, was, was a big part of what they were talking about a couple of years ago. And like, is there a way that like all artists can actually have at least some level of, you know, um, sustainable income so that they can explore and, and kind of grow? Another aspect that I like about that is that um, I've got this as a failed artist. I've got this sense that um, that the art world I always describe it as a ladder with one rung at the top. Like, there's not a lot of great ways. Like, not a lot of people appreciate um, emotionally or financially artists that are early on, right? Um, so if you're early on, you're probably not that good yet. You're feeling your way through. You don't really know what your vision is. And our world doesn't isn't very good to you if you're an artist at that stage. We kind of just like you know, between the snobbishness and the lack of funding and all this, that, and the other, how many artists that could have become great later on just didn't have the support they needed early on, right? And I think mm -hmm. Dada was very in tune to that. It was less about how advanced you were and more about um, how willing you were to participate in the community and, and kind of grow together. Um, so yeah, love Dada um, and definitely check out their their longer paper that I can't do justice. You should have them on me, Cole, if you haven't, because um, I think yeah. they'll it really well. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I will, mm. for sure. Um, I, I've been reading so much uh, about them uh, on Medium, uh, but I, I kind of feel like I don't, like I, I need to speak to them to actually like fully grasp the concept because I, I don't feel like the, the art, I don't feel like I fully get it. You know, I want to, mm. I want to see like, yeah, I kind of understood, but I feel, I don't feel confident enough to, so I definitely have to, yeah, have them on and speak because the concept is is really, really cool. Like it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's very unique and they're, they're really thought yeah. leaders, which which are ahead of many, many others in, in some sort. You know, I think what Jason kind of wanted or, or, or Jason uh, mentioned is, you know, they wanted to create an environment where they also, the, the, the young non-successful artists keep creating, you know, and with this basic income, you know, um, he's not. He's kind of incentivized to keep creating because as long as he creates and contributes, even though it might not sell, you know, his contribution will to some sort of pay off in some sense, you know, towards the whole community. And artists who um, who are able to sell and and contribute financially to the group will also kind of support all the other artists, you know. So that means everybody should be winning, right? And I think the kind of the interesting structures they or, or, or thoughts they have is they kind of really try to disincentivize flipping and other mechanisms, right? And they try mm -hmm. to really think conscientiously and, and, and strategic about it. You know, the, the first series, um, which, which Jason collected, I, I, I forgot the name. Um, Creeps and Weirdos? Creeps and Weirdos, you know, was, was for years forgotten. It was uncollected because they kind of deactivated it and then people found like a loophole to collect them finally. And then once this came out, it was gone like within a day, you know, but like they kind of really try to, to build the ecosystem first before they, they really roll it out. And I think that's, you know, it's definitely something to look at and understand more. And I think a lot of people could learn valuable lessons just from, from you know, the train of thoughts or, or. Yeah. And actually talking about forgotten projects, um, not forgotten, but, you know, less talked about, let's say, mm -hmm. um, you both mentioned like rare pepes. And I yes. think it's uh, it's probably like the the one um, I, I've now like the, the lately, actually, I've been hearing more about it. I think, you know, because of like CryptoPunks, obviously, like being uh, so, so mainstream, like people kind of, you know, then traced it back to uh, before CryptoPunks, uh, rare pepes. Yeah. And I want to ask you both, like, why do you think it's um it kind of got you know side sidetracked a little bit um maybe just a few few words before rare pepe right let's talk about the whole counterparty community i think this is something um most of the counterparty projects were kind of forgotten you know really um didn't really get a lot of attention at all and and are still kind of disregarded but what people don't consider is you know counterparty the currency itself people burned their bitcoin to create a, a currency you know they really burned their bitcoins to create 
a currency which is which is based on this value they destroyed you know and and in this system based on this currency a lot of early projects were created which which hardly anybody talks about and and it's it's you know it's very frustrating i think for the community to to be kind of um having contributed and and having led the path which many many others adopted after and being totally left in the shadow over and over and over again. I think one of these elements, uh, maybe the most, was the Rare Paper project, right? Which, mm -hmm. which was, which was, which I find in in several ways just so fascinating because you know not only was it kind of like the first really like um, user generated platform where really users would create the art. Um, which was not, you know, done by an individual artist or done by a corporation or or, or a company, which creates kind of like a game or or collectible. It was really like everybody could participate in it. There would be still, you know, the scientists which would kind of decide which card would be minted, but it was like really entirely user generated, and that kind of shaped with with the Rare Pepe Wallet, kind of the way um, a lot of projects later on were designed and and conceptualized after. Um, another element of it, which I find tremendously fascinating, is that a lot of the the conceptual artworks on Rare Pepe's you will see later in Ethereum art. You know, like for instance, I like the Invisible Pepe. You know, which is which which we then saw later on from many other artists trying like pixel art or invisible invisibles on other platforms as well. But all that there it is. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's 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 so many projects, and and if you look through the history of the rare Pepe's and all the generations, and there's actually um, a book, the rarest book, which which yeah. kind of summarizes. Um, I have it here too, but if you are closer to it, Jason, <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm actually nervous now because it should be in my bookshelf and I can't find it. I still have it in the <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up. <laughs> but is, is this by Eleonora, right? Yes, it's yep. um, yeah. it's basically yeah, yeah. it features all the rare pepes, um, all, all the official rare pepes, and and you know this overview is like really this is like kind of like a, a browsing back through the history. You know, you see political references, you see references in pop culture, you see you see um, developments which we later on see in other in the Ethereum ecosystem. You know, we have like generative projects. You have um, you have like even the first game, programmable art. You have you know you have a lot of things which which were there before, and and let you know with 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 the Pepe becoming some sort of of symbol, which was uh, misappropriated. You know that that the Ethereum community. You know, in the in 2018, there were kind of like charts published which showed always the ecosystem. Like these are the projects in art, these are the projects in tech, in fintech, and so on. So suddenly, you know, Rare Pepe started to disappear from all these overviews, and and the process started, which a lot of people refer to as greenwashing. You know, people mm -hmm. didn't want to kind of the Pepe is being associated with the movement anymore. Um, although they contributed so tremendously and were so influential, you know, in, in the direction, in the in the in the mechanisms, in the community, you know, in the community building and and so on. And I think this is something which 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 I I found very interesting to discover more deeply. You know, like I kind of um, were able to connect with a very welcoming community. You know, with with you know. Joe Looney back then helped me even create an artwork for Rare F2. <laughs> you know, it was not related to Pepe's, but like, you know, it's genuine people and 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 they all of them are just like looking at this NFT and like, you know, this is not the first. <laughs> this is this is nice, but like, you know, we have seen that before. And I think it's important for us that, you know, even even if it's, you know, maybe some part of the history with the controversy is uh, maybe you know uncomfortable it's nevertheless part of the history and it has to be shared and and they have to have their place in the history of it yeah i think you did uh, an amazing job there martin i feel like it's good that someone else is saying it because i think people get tired of me defending uh rare pepe over and over <laughs> again but you know look for me it really is that um it's it has a um not rare pepe wallet that community is great but the rare pepe himself has a, a complex past that largely, um, you know, got complicated and was seen as an alt-right hate symbol after the Rare Pepe community had already kind of gotten itself up and running. 
And uh, I remember going to Ray Ray F1 early 2018 and being trepidatious because all I knew, like a lot of other people about Pepe, was that it was a hate symbol, right? So mm -hmm. I kind of came in anxious, like, you know, knowing that it was an important project, but not knowing if I could, you know, hang out with those people. And they were like some of the most diverse, like loving, immediately accepting, creative mm -hmm. um, people in, in the space, right? Um, so it is sad and problematic that people take it's really laziness for lack of a better description it's a lot easier to start with something you know that's uh you know the punks are great i love matt and john but i think you know starting with them makes sense for mainstream journalists because they're like i'm already talking about a complicated thing that people don't understand and now i have to layer on top of that an explanation of what pepe is right so mm -hmm. they tend to get skipped for that reason which I think it's horrible. Look, you know, art's full, art history and history in general is full of all kinds of complex things. And that's what makes it rich and exciting. So if we're going to be lazy and just jump over everything that's even remotely challenging, we're not going to be left with much. Right. So, you know, I think um, I'm glad that Martin did such a great job of explaining it. And I think we need to get that story out more. And, and those folks um, as a community really did spawn a lot of this um, at, at scale. Um, so I think they deserve credit. But I actually, I have to jump here um, yeah. in a minute, Miko. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think this is this was my 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 closing uh, question. So absolutely, <laughs> I don't want to take up more of your time. But thank you both so much. Uh, I think, you know, it's super important to give the context to this, like your really pillars of of this community so for me it's it's a pleasure to speak to you both so thanks a lot honored to be asked to be on uh, yeah thanks so much for okay. having us. thank you Miko. Okay. bye 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 we'll talk to you as always martin take care talking to you cheers cheers bye bye